a couple of uh, just kind of housekeeping things as we get get rolling here. Um, student, congratulations on being out of school. Everybody happy? Yeah, excited about it. Teachers, congratulations on being out of school. Um, a lot of family vacations started. You know, school in our district got out uh, Thursday at uh, you know whatever time, like 3:35. I'm pretty sure vacation started at 3:36 as people were headed out of town. And so lots of you have been on vacation or going on vacation said, hey, we're going to be watching wherever we're at. So would you please send me an email? Would you send me a text? Would you send me some kind of confirmation that you're watching today, wherever you're watching from, from across the world? We'd just love to know where you're at, where you're tuned in, and, and so you could get going. So we just want to say uh, have a great summer, but don't forget if you're on vacation, you can continue uh, to give electronically. You can continue to worship with us by getting on the website and all those kind of things, and we'd love to have you worship with us. Uh, another thing we... We really try to create an environment here where never, nobody ever feels embarrassed or, or put on the spot or uh, those kind of things, but that doesn't uh, fly if you're in my life group, and so uh, I reserve the right to embarrass you, and so we have a, we have a couple right down front celebrating their one-year anniversary today, so yeah, so um, uh, Jed and Bailey and Autumn and I were, were, were praying for them last night, and uh, remembering last year as we were at their reception and those kind of things, and we're like, grief, does that seem, does it seem like a year? No, it's gone really fast, and so congratulations, happy, happy anniversary, as uh, they're in the process of beginning a, the kind of home that God wants them to have, and so we're just convinced, my friends, that there's no place like home. There's no place like home when those who are in charge understand that it is the environment, the main environment, for young people to be built up and encouraged to be a pleasure both to God and to the rest of the world. There's no place like home. Today we want to talk about when those who are in charge grab a hold of four key principles for parenting. We're going to talk about three of them today, and we're going to talk about the other one uh, two weeks from today. Uh, kind of as a public service announcement. I always do this in May, but I very er rarely do this in June. Anybody next week is? Father's Day. Don't forget. And we're going to talk next week. Kind of take a little pause in the flow of this, get this series and talk about how to honor mom and dad. So parents, you want to make sure your children are here next week. Uh, we're going to be talking to them specifically about what it means to, to honor mom and dad. But today I want to talk with you about, in a, in a teaching I've just called, uh, uh, Stop, Look, and Listen. Any, anybody remember that little poem? I, I learned it when I was a little boy. Maybe you got help from Romper Room. Maybe you got help from Barney, the big purple dinosaur. Maybe from the Zoom kids. Maybe Dora the Explorer. I don't know who you get help from nowadays as, as parents. But stop, look, and listen before you cross the street. Use your eyes. Use your ears. Then use your feet. And I want to share with you what I believe are three very key principles for parenting. What it means to stop. What it means to look. And what it means to listen. Over the course of this teaching series, I've just been asked a lot, Tim, I, I don't see, you keep talking about these kind of families. Are there these kind of families that exist? Are there these kind of homes where, where good things really happen, where God is honored? Because everything that we see uh, about families usually isn't portraying strong families in our society. We hear the bad examples, and we see the bad stories, and we, we, we hear everything that's negative. And we look at our families and we say, hey, America, American families especially are just weak. And there are all kinds of things and all kinds of studies and all kinds of things you can go to that talk about the negativity. But I don't think we need to dwell on the negative. There's a professor who used to be at Oklahoma State University that did a, a study. And he wanted to do the, the, the strong family research project is what he called it. And so he opened it up to families across the world. He talked to families in North America. He talked to families in South America. He talked to families in uh, Austria, in Germany in Switzerland, in South Africa. He, he wasn't talking to any specific uh, society. He wasn't talking to any specific uh, religious group. In fact, it really wasn't a religious study. And he just wanted to know, if you hold to a high view of marriage and you hold to a high view of family, what are the things that make you strong? These are the things that he wanted to investigate. And so he discovered from all these families across the world six characteristics of strong families. And, and they are these. Uh, number one, they're committed to family that there was just an unwavering commitment. We are together. We will stick together. There's a commitment to family. Secondly, uh, that they spend time together. They intentionally spend time together. Third, that they have good family communication. And two weeks from today, we're going to talk about the power of words. That's the fourth skill, learning to talk to our children. Uh, fourth, that they express appreciation to and for one another. That they express appreciation to each other and for each other. Uh, Five, that there's a spiritual commitment, whatever that might be. It wasn't specifically Christianity, but there was a spiritual commitment, a spiritual component to family life. And then uh, finally, that they're able to solve problems in a crisis. 
And so strong families exist. And you look through that list and you're kind of mentally processing that now and say, hey, maybe we're batting about uh, 50%, about 500, or maybe you're like, hey, I'm one out of six or, or whatever. And you've already found in and zeroed in on some areas where you can start to grow strong. Or maybe you're here today and your heart's just breaking for your child. I was six or seven, I don't remember, which would have made my brother uh, nine or ten. And I remember vividly uh, one day while our family was going through what let's just call uh, intergenerational negotiations, right? Um, and things weren't going so well for the younger generation of the family, let's just put it that way. Uh, they're going through intergenerational negotiations. My brother just was fed up and he decided he was going to run away from home. And those of you who've had the privilege of meeting my mother, this will come as no surprise to you. Uh, she helped him pack his bag and sent him on the way out the door. And he walked down the driveway, he turned south, and he began to walk away. And I watched him as he walked away, and I'm standing in the yard, and I watch him, and I see him about a block and a half away or so, and he stops. And I look back at the door, and my mom's standing in the doorway with tears just streaming down her face. And maybe you're here and listening. Something like that's going on with one of your children. They've turned their back on you. They've turned a different than a 10-year-old running away. It's, it, it, they've turned your back on you, on what you believe, and there's some breakdown intergenerationally, and you're not sure what's going to happen next, and your heart is just broken. Can, can our family be tied back together? And I would simply say, if we will learn these skills, whether we're single parents or step parents, whether we're empty nesters or your nest is so full, you get your, your, what I would call no resters, right? You're just going all over the place and you just have no rest for the weary. If you'll learn these three skills that we want to talk about today, I believe God can begin to do some amazing things and make your home the kind of home where, where children are built up and encouraged to become a blessing and a pleasure both to God and every generation they ever encounter. There's no place like home if you parents, those of you in charge of these homes, would learn these three skills. So let's take a look at them. And uh, One is stop, one is look, and one is the ability to listen. So when it comes to stop, I would simply say it this way. And I warned my children early on as uh, we were getting ready for today, I said I'm going to be corny during the teaching, so just brace yourself for it. And I would say when it comes to stop, each and every one of us needs to learn this skill. We need to learn how to stop, drop, and roll with God. There comes a time in times of crisis or times of calmness where we just need to be as parents able to stop and focus in on God and hear God's voice and understand what it is that God wants. We need to be able to drop to our knees and say, God, this is out of my control. I have no way of knowing how to handle this, God. I don't know how this is going to end, but I'm going to surrender to the fact that you're God and I'm not. I'm going to surrender to the fact that you love my child more than I love my child and you will be God in their life. And God, we will recognize you as God here. And then there needs to come a time when we've done that, when we simply say, okay, God, I'm going to roll your way. I'm going to do the things the way you want me to do. And I'm not looking at any, any bestseller other than, other than your word. And I can take advice from all kinds of parenting and all kinds of preachers, but God, I'm going to dig into your word and say, what is your way for me to parent? So when it comes to that, God gives us great insight in the fifth book of the Bible, the book of Deuteronomy, in the sixth chapter. It's a passage of scripture that most of us have become familiar with over the years, and it's known as the Shema. It's, the passage starts, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is the Lord alone. But it really starts a couple of verses ahead of that. When God's talking to the people of Israel, he says, I'm about ready to let you go into the land that I promised you. And you're going to go in and you're going to take possession of it. And if you want to have a long life when you get there, if you want your children to benefit and you want your grandchildren to benefit and you want everybody to enjoy life, hear the commands that I'm giving you today and you need to obey them. And one of the first things that he shows them in this passage of Scripture is how to stop, drop, and roll with God. If you've got your Bible open, and you can kind of see it on your teaching outline, there are four words that I'd encourage you to circle. About verse 4, I'd encourage you to circle the word here. About verse 7, I'd encourage you uh, to circle, uh, verse, I'm sorry, verse 5, I'd encourage you to circle the word love. About verse 7, I'd encourage you to circle the word teach. Then around down 14, 15, I'd encourage you to circle the word fear. There are four verbs, there are four actions that you and I are supposed to be involved in. Now, what I want you to remember in the Hebrew language, when it comes to a verb, it, it's not just uh, the action, not just hear, it doesn't just mean listen, it means uh, to obey. And so the first thing that happens when I learn to stop in front of God is I have to hear the truth continually. How many of you parents have ever had a discussion like this with, with your children during your intergenerational negotiations? And you've, you've simply said, uh, you, you've told them what you wanted them what you wanted done, 
and they go away about their own business, and the response you give to them at that moment then is, did you hear what I said? Anybody else other than me? Yeah, a few of you. Did you really want to know if they heard it, or were you really asking, how come you didn't do what I said? Right? There's an expectation that when you hear, there's corresponding behavior. And that's what God is saying. I want you to hear, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the Lord alone. I think this is talking about God's uniqueness, and I think it's talking about God's unity. One of your trans- some of the translations you're reading from say, uh, the Lord our God is, God is one. I think the more accurate translation is God alone. He's unique. And what I need to hear continually is that God is unique. And by hearing the fact that God is unique, I simply acknowledge, okay, God, you're God and I'm not. You have a right to a place in my home. I will acknowledge your presence. I will surrender to your, I will rely on your power and I will give you your rightful place. And in these moments, God, when I don't know what to do, I will trust that your way is the right way or I'll trust that your will is the way that I'm supposed to walk. And God, I will acknowledge that here in this place. But what I want to encourage you to do when it comes to hearing the truth continually is we as parents need to learn to verbalize it to our children. We need to make it personal. When we're going through family uh, crisis or we're going through moments, we need to be able as those in charge of our homes to stop and simply say, okay, everybody involved. Kids, we need to take a moment and we need to recognize God's unique place in our family. We need to acknowledge his presence We need to give him his rightful place. We need to surrender to his power. And we just need to say, God, you're welcome in this place. And God, we want to do what you want to do. God, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts aren't your thoughts. God, bring some clarity. Bring some calming. Bring that to this situation. Just continually hear the truth continually. It it builds confidence in God. I have confidence in you. And I will trust you and rely on you completely. So I encourage you, hear the truth continually. But I would submit to you, you're never going to be able to hear the truth in a moment of crisis if you haven't first developed the discipline of hearing the truth in moments of calmness. If you haven't developed the discipline of going to God's word and reading God's word and hearing what God has to say, of recognizing and acknowledging his place, his rightful place in your home. So the question is, are you hearing the truth continually. The second thing we need to do when we stop and we drop in front of God, we hear the truth continually, but we love God passionately. If you're following along in your Bible that you can write in or on your teaching outline, would you please, as I read this circle, all the times the word you or your appears? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strengths. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your heart. He's talking to parents. He's saying, parents, before you can expect your children to love God passionately, you have to love God passionately. Parents, before you can expect your children to give God their all, you have to give God your all. The reality is, I cannot pass on to to my children uh, a principle that I don't embrace or practice. I can talk about it. I can tell them this ought to be. The best one maybe is honesty. I I can tell my children, I need you to be honest, but my my children see me continually being dishonest. What are they going to learn, honesty or dishonesty? dishonesty. And if I tell my children, I want you to love God, but they don't see me loving God. If they don't see me listening to God's voice, if they don't see me surrendering to God's leadership, if they don't see me trusting God's lordship for my future, they're never going to learn those things as well. What God's talking about here when he talks about loving God passionately is he wants us to model the truth. He wants us to be models of the truth. Now he wants us to teach our children, and that comes next. He says we need to teach our children diligently. Two weeks from today, we're going to talk about what that means. What does it mean to teach our children diligently? Two things that I just want to point out, well, three things that I want to point out quickly in this passage that we'll get to two weeks from today in more detail. The word to teach literally means repetition. Repetition. How many of you taught your children how to learn something by repetition? Spelling, spelling words, math times tables, addition, right? You taught, it's repetition. You got flashcards, you're doing it by repetition. It's the same thing when it comes to learning about God. You need to, with repetition, teach them about God, teach them about God, teach them about God. Then it says we're to do it diligently. The word means to sharpen. It's what we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks, that, that all of our children have an individual bent towards sin, right? And there are just some places in their life, I apologize because I, I'm one of them, but, but there are just some places in our lives where we're dull and our children are dull when it comes to spiritual things. And our task is to sharpen them up spiritually. And then it gives us the, the method of how we're supposed to do that. It says, and talk to them. We're going to talk two weeks from today about how to talk to our children and the power of words. 
The word for talk in the Hebrew language, there are actually two. There's one word for talk that means lecture, and there's another word that just means conversation. The word that's used here is conversation. I need to learn how to have spiritual conversations with my children. It needs to flow off my tongue as easily as conversations about my favorite athletic team, about my favorite uh, you know, television show, about whatever it is. I need to be able to talk just easily and consistently with my children. Hear the truth continually. Love God passionately. Teach your children diligently. And then finally, fear God greatly. Fear God greatly. Look what it says in this passage. Fear the Lord your God. Serve Him only. Take your oaths in His name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God. To fear God simply means to love God so much that I refuse to disregard His ways or disobey His will. I'm not going to, God, I'm not going to disregard your ways and I'm not going to disobey your will. And our children see us fearing God, reverencing God, giving God His rightful place. So I just want to ask you, are you taking time every single day of your life to stop, drop, and roll with God? God, I'm stopping and acknowledging you. I'm dropping in front of you and surrendering who I am and, and my children to you. And God, I'm just going to go your way. When we do this, I believe that it, that it gives us a spirit of authenticity. It gives us a spirit of authenticity. And our children want to see something that's authentic. Our children are amazing receptors of information. But our children are lousy interpreters of information. What they can interpret very well, though, is inconsistency and hypocrisy. And they see it. And to live this way, stop, drop, and roll with God is a spirit of authenticity. And the only way to develop that spirit of authenticity is when parents meet often and alone with God. Parents, these commandments are to be on your heart. You're to love God with all your soul, with all your might. You need to assume primary responsibility for the evangelization and discipleship of your children. Stop, drop, and roll with God. The second skill that we need to learn and take advantage of is the ability to look. And I put it this way. We need to be able to look ahead. We need to be able to look at. And we need to be able to look after for our children. Look ahead, look at, and look after. One of the things that I enjoy doing with my dad was, was learning to fish, and part of learning to fish was taking the family canoe out. And I remember growing up and, and being in the canoe, and we talked a couple of weeks ago about certain laws, that there are laws that you just don't violate. And one of the laws in the canoe was you don't stand up in the canoe when you're on the water. And so my father taught me that law, and the first time I stood up in the canoe while we were on the water, he promptly tipped me out of the canoe to teach me that there is a law, don't stand up in the canoe. But I couldn't wait until I was old enough or he would allow me to start to, to be at the back of the canoe and, and steer the canoe the direction it needed to go. And the first lesson of learning to steer the canoe was you always need to be looking ahead. You need to be paying attention to what's down the river. You need to know what's ahead of you. And I cannot tell you the number of times, whether in the canoe or the boat, when I got to you know, drive the boat or use the motor, I cannot tell you the number of times I bumped the canoe or the boat into the side of the lake or the river. And my father would simply look at me and say, what'd you do wrong? You didn't look ahead. And so many of us as parents forget that part of our task, maybe our number one task, is to look ahead to the things that our children are going to face. And I just want to share with you five or six things that if God blesses you with children, I can promise you if they mature naturally and they mature normally and they just grow as God would have them to grow, they are going to come across these things and you need to be prepared for them. Look at what Deuteronomy 31 says. God is striding ahead of you. He's right there with you. He won't let you down. He won't leave you. Don't be intimidated. Don't worry. And our, our children are not going to be intimidated and our children aren't going to worry if they know that we're going ahead of them, if we're looking at them, striding right there with them, and if we're coming behind them. So what does it mean to look ahead? First of all, parents, look ahead for moments of faith. Your child will, sounds like a strong statement, but let me say it again, your child will have questions of faith. God's word says that God has planted eternity in the human heart. Each and every person has this planted deep in their heart, and I believe a child has to be taught not to believe in God. On one occasion, there's some people trying to bring little children to Jesus, and the disciples stop them, and Jesus says, don't do that. It's better for you that a millstone be hung around your neck than that you keep one of these little children from coming to me. Do you remember on another occasion, Jesus is teaching, 
And he said, unless you have faith like a what, you won't, interpret, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. I heard it. Unless you have faith like a child. Your child will have issues of faith. Positive, maybe negative, and you need to be prepared. Just know that it's coming. I would encourage you to lose your fear of the G word. Don't be afraid to talk to your child about God. Don't pawn that responsibility off on anybody else. The church can help you. Your pastors can help you. But it is first and foremost your responsibility to talk to your children about who God is. You don't know where to begin. Your children are still young. Start with creation. They're in awe. Little children know that there's something bigger than them, right? They want to know what it is. There will be issues of faith. Secondly, let me encourage you to prepare parents for uh, something that's downriver, let's call it just uh, moments of insecurity. Your child will feel insecure. Your child will want to know that when everything else around them is falling apart, what do they have to hold on to? Is there anything that's stable? Is there anything that's consistent? Is there anything that's normal? When your child's going through insecurity, those are some of the things that you can begin to put into practice in your home that will bring security, a sense of normalcy, a sense of uh, uh, regularity, a sense of stability. And so your child's going to Want to know, what can I hang on to? Maybe the picture of insecurity. Uh, if you ever taught your child how to ride a bike, right? You want them to feel secure. And so they're not secure. So the first thing you put on the bike is what? After they move off the tricycle, the first thing you put on that first bicycle is? Training, training wheels. And you give them that security and say, okay, so you're learning to get your balance. And then that day for the training wheels comes off. And not everybody does this the same way. But how many of you, when you're teaching your child to ride the bike, you grabbed a hold of the seat behind them? And as they pedal, yeah, me too. You grabbed a hold of the seat behind, you ran as fast as you could run, and you didn't know how fast those little legs could pedal, did you? Or how badly out of shape you were. But there comes that moment when you let go. Your child's doing okay until when? They realize your hand's gone. And all of our children, whether they admit it or not, are always going to want to know that your hand of presence is available in their lives. And the distance to that seat grows. But they're going to want to know. And they're going to struggle with feelings of insecurity. Next, um, if your child is normal, natural, and growing, down the road there's this nasty thing called puberty. And you need to prepare for it now. And you need not be afraid of those discussions about sexuality, about relationships, you need to be prepared, man, for those times when they're going through puberty and they are at a high, they're just exhilarated beyond exhilaration, and the next minute they are just as depressed as depressed can be. They've got all these hormones and all these things raging through their body. But don't be scared of it. I lived in a home growing up where my mother wasn't afraid to talk about anything. And it was a very common occurrence in our home growing up. We had a formal dining room and we'd come for dinner and we'd sit down for dinner and we'd pray and my mother would begin a conversation about sex as we were growing up. I'm like, good, great, really? Another one of these? I can remember a time in college when my mom and dad came to visit and said, hey, we want to take you and some of your buddies, ask your roommate, ask a couple guys out, we'll take you out for dinner. And, and there was a, a place in Chicago at the time uh, called Baker's Square. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Baker's Square, but Baker's Square is a restaurant and it was famous for their pies. So you kind of went to Food was okay, but the dessert, man, that was something. Now, my mom's favorite pie is French silk pie. And so we're sitting at dinner, and she orders French silk pie. And I remember vividly, dear God, don't let her say it. 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 And her French silk pie came, and she took a bite of that French silk pie, and she said, boys, you know what? This is better than sex. <laughs> and we began to have a discussion about sexuality. I'm like, a grief, what? Now, they never went to dinner with us again, but, you know, there, you know, there was a little kind of thing. A couple of years ago for my 47th birthday, my girls made me a poster board that they taped to my door of my office at home. And it said, 47 reasons we love dad. And number 26 involved discussions about puberty and sexuality. And so now the joke is, hey, Dad, that's 26, you know, you know kind, of, kind of deal. But there's that moment when you just have to have, the, my friends, it's coming. Don't hide your head in the sand. Be ready to have those discussions. 
Be ready to share with them convictions. It's coming. Next, uh, performance. We live in a world where our value for so many people is gathered by how well they perform. If you perform at this level, I will love you. If you perform at this level, our society will say you have value. My friends, you're going to deal with your children. Some of them are going to be overperformers. Some of them are going to be underachievers. But all of them are going to struggle at some point in time with whether or not their value and their sense of worth and their sense of identity comes with how well they perform. Worst case scenario, a mom brings me a middle school young boy to talk with. He and his dad are having relationship issues. And I'm talking to the son, and I'm like, what's going on? He's like, I don't want to play football anymore. But I know if I don't play football, dad's going to be mad. Dad comes in a couple of weeks later, and we're, he and I are talking. I said, this is what your son had to say. He's like, he's right. If he can no longer throw a spiral on a football, he will no longer have my love. It's not an isolated case, my friends. It is not an isolated case. So many times our children are taught and come to understand that their value or their sense of worth is based solely on their performance. It's coming. Be ready for that discussion. Next, we'll just, just talk about peers for a minute. You've been around Miami Valley for a long time. You know, the verse I share with you that we need to share with our children is, you know, bad company corrupts good character. Uh, read the study in preparation for this teaching series. You can read the study read a whole bunch of them and you can pick the age that you want to pull out because each study says a different age. But the reality of it is there comes a point in time in our children's life where their peer group is the dominant influencer over us, right? Does it have to be that way? I don't think so. Not if we have healthy discussions about peers and making friends and staying away from the wrong people. And so Book of Proverbs is a huge help. And then finally, just let me share with you what I'll call passages. Passages. There are going to be a whole lot of firsts that come your way. First day of school, first steps, first day of college, first breakup, first boyfriend, first girlfriend. There are going to be a whole lot of first, a whole lot of passages that happen in their life. Be, be prepared for those. Autumn and I got married, went on a honeymoon, came back from the honeymoon, and a week later moved to Dallas, about seven hours away from where our uh, parents lived and we've never lived that's the closest we've ever uh, lived to any of our parents and so what I'm about ready to share with you I'm going to share with you because I'm pretty sure Autumn's mom and my mom joined uh, in prayer that our daughters would never live close to home that we'd get you know what what we did to them we would experience but in the midst of that from the time we found out Autumn was pregnant with our oldest then with our second then with our third from the day we found out they were she was pregnant we already began to pray that God would help us release them. And I can promise you, taking them to a college campus, watching them drive away out of your driveway to a, live in another state is not easy. But I can promise you it was easier because we've been praying that prayer respectively for 18, 20, 21 years because we knew those things were coming, that God had to prepare our heart and that when they said goodbye to us, our desire was that they were ready to say hello to the world. And if we've done our job, there's no place like home for that to happen. The discipline of looking ahead. That's what I'll just call the discipline of foresight. Then there's the discipline of looking at, investigating the moment, and just saying, hey, every moment is filled with the opportunity to be a, a teaching moment, to develop their morality, to develop their character, to develop their spirituality. There is just that moment. And we need to look at those moments and say, this is that moment. And evaluate the moment and, and master that moment. So we, we've got to investigate the situation. I'll talk more about that in just a minute. And then we have to have the ability to look after. The discipline to look at is the discipline of fully being fully present. The discipline of looking after is the discipline of follow through. Remember last week we talked about uh, this great tool that God's given us, the godly rebuke. Well, I think another great tool God's given us is the godly review. And so many, many of us just punish and then punishment's over and we move on and we don't review with them. I'm not looking for a lecture. I'm not looking for anything else. I'm just looking for, hey, this is the deal. God's word says, whatever they've gone through, maybe they've given into temptation and there's been a punishment. God's word says, no temptation is taking you except what's common to man. But God's faithful. 
He'll not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. And when you are tempted, he'll provide a way of escape so that you can stand up underneath it. My friends, my daughter, that's the truth in your life. That you were tempted with this and God gave you a way out and you didn't take it. Where was the way out? And you begin to process with it. Well, the way out was here and the way out was here. And what we come to understand is our children, and most of us too, if we're honest, don't start looking for the way out until we're way into the sin. Then we're looking for the way out and it gets harder to find. And so this, this discipline of looking after and reviewing with them what's going on in their life. And so it's the discipline of follow through. Just let me say it this way. Remember God said, I want you to go into the land and I want it to be good for you, for your children, and for their children. Parents, I would simply say this. Your obedience and or disobedience will affect you, it will affect those around you, and it will affect everyone who comes after you. Your obedience in raising your children will affect you, it will affect your child, and it will affect your grandchildren. Your disobedience will affect you, your child, and your grandchildren, and those who come after. It's just the way, and so it's this discipline of follow-through. So let me share with you what I call the 20th Street Principle of Parenting. My brother takes off running away from home. We live on 18th Street, and he walks a couple of blocks down. He's headed south to 20th Street, and he stops, and he's there, and I don't know how long he's there. It seemed like for a long time, and my mom's watching, and all of a sudden, I see my brother starting to walk back up the little hill of Highview up back to the house, and he gets to the yard, and I'm like, you came home? Yes. Why'd you come home? Well, I got down there, and I remembered... Mom and Dad won't let me cross 20th Street by myself. <laughs> and where I wanted to go was on the other side of 20th Street. My friends, this is the picture of looking ahead, looking at, and looking after. A parent lays down the law and says, you are not allowed to cross 20th Street by yourself. I know there's stuff on the other side. Now, we grew up in a family where we had one car and dad had it at work so during the summer if we wanted to go anywhere we went by bicycle or we walked and mom went with us and there was a lot of stuff to do on the other side of 20th street but when we walked guess what mom held our hands and decided when it was safe to cross the street but there came a point in time when she stopped holding our hands she still decided but we were able to follow her then there came this unreal point in time when we were walking and she said, okay, you choose when to cross 20th Street. Now there are a couple times I stepped out. I told you last week I was just done. There's a couple times I stepped out and I got grabbed by the shirt collar and yanked back. And then you learn one, two, three, go. You know, you learn all those other things. And there's just those times. And then there came this unbelievable day. When we got to 20th Street. She said, you choose when to go. She wasn't holding my hand. She wasn't walking beside me, she was behind me. And then this most unbelievable day when she simply said, you want to go to Tom Harrod's house? He lived on the other side of 20th Street. Go ahead. Ride your bike, go ahead. She didn't walk with me. She wasn't at the intersection with me. She wasn't watching traffic. She couldn't drag me back. Isn't that how parenting works? There comes a point in time when we lay down a principle or a law. We're looking ahead. But then we begin to look at. We look at our child's maturity. We look at their growth. We look at everything they're going through. And that rule or that law becomes a principle. You only cross the street when. Right? And then, that's been so well taught that each person can apply it for herself or himself. Go ahead. You will cross the street. I'm pretty sure I never looked back, but I'm pretty sure my mom was standing in the doorway watching those first few times that I still crossed 20th Street. But that's the principle that's in play. If we will look ahead, if we will look at, and we will come along after, we equip our children to say hello to the world when they say goodbye to us. We need to look. And finally, we need to listen. Most of us don't know how to listen. A great part of my ministry, a great part of my task in the past years, you know, Monday through Friday, has been listening. A lot of people walk into my office of all different kinds of ages, teenagers, adults. And their main complaint is, I don't know, nobody listens to me. We have trouble listening to words. But listening, man, it takes 
time, it takes work, and it takes prayer. It's not easy. And I, I'm convinced that our children want to tell us stuff. And they drop hints that they want to tell us stuff, and we're just not cued into it. So, so let me just share with you very quickly some things you ought to be l- listening for. First of all, let me encourage you to be listening for silence. I can remember a discussion we were having around the kitchen table one night about some things that were going on in our family, and one of our daughters was unusually quiet, didn't say a word, out of character for her. And so after the discussion got done, I made an excuse, hey, I've got to run up to the office for something, hey, why don't you ride with me? And we hopped in the car and we headed for the office. I'm like, you were awful quiet at dinner, what's going on? She began to cry. Dad, I wanted to say something, but I didn't know how to say it. She began to express how she was feeling and what she was going through. And I was afraid if I said it this way that it would upset this person. If I said it that way, it would upset this person. And if I said it this way, it would like throwing somebody under the bus. And so she began to process. And so you listen for those silent moments and you say, okay, we need to have a conversation. Secondly, let me encourage you to listen for questions. Most of us miss them. If you've been preparing in advance that there are going to be questions of faith, guess what? Questions of faith are going to come. And it's been a lousy day. You've struggled at work. You ran home, you got off late, you had to run home, you had about seven minutes to fix dinner, eat dinner, and get out the door. One had to be at the soccer complex, one had to be at Color Garden, one has to be at the baseball field. And you've got three different places to go, and all you want is a moment of quiet. So you give them your smartphone, you give them the iPad, maybe they've got their own, and just leave me alone. And you can handle the noise that's going on with all the games that they're playing, the video that's playing in the van or whatever, when all of a sudden from the back you hear, Hey mom, what's God look like? What are you going to do? If you have prepared in advance and know that moment of faith is coming, when that question's asked, you're going to be ready to respond. Questions of faith are coming. Maybe you're teaching your child about one of your favorite pastimes. For me, it might have been baseball. And I can remember teaching my girls how to score old-fashioned way a baseball game. And, you know, I'm teaching them how to do that. And I can remember on one occasion we're watching a game and we're scoring it even on TV. We're scoring the game and there's a fight on the field. One of the girls said, hey, Daddy, I thought you said that guy was a Christian. Are Christians allowed to fight on the athletic field and that's okay? What a great question. And that was the time I needed to turn off the TV. We needed to have that discussion. We needed to stop scoring the game. Be ready for questions. Third, third, listen for hunger pains. If you hear your child and you have the ability, you hear your child's stomach growl and you know they're hungry, what are you going to do? You're going to feed them. I'm talking about the kind of hunger pains of, when they're hungry for affection, or they're hungry for tenderness, or they're hungry for compassion. Do you know when your child's hungry for those kind of things? Are, are, are you so tuned in? Are you listening? Are you paying attention? Listen for hunger pains. And finally, just listen for feelings. It's pretty easy to listen to the words or just to the tone, but not understand what's going on. I, I was in an airport and I was traveling back and the flight that we were supposed to, I, I got from Charlotte to Atlanta and then I was supposed to have an Atlanta to Dayton connection and the Charlotte flight was late and I, I got in and everybody's scrambling up to the ticket counter, right, to try to find, are you going to put me up? Am I going to catch another plane? What's going to happen? And the people in front of me is a mom and a dad and they were just going at each other. And they were yelling, and it was loud, and they were screaming. They had a little girl over here. I don't know how old she was. I'm guessing she couldn't have been more than four. And she had a backpack on her back. And she also had a little suitcase that had wheels on it. She took her backpack off and threw it at her mommy. And her mommy said these words to her. You, stand still right there, and don't say a word. The mommy could have taken the same advice for herself. Her daughter was feeling the tension between her mom and her dad. And all they responded to was the action. The action needed to be responded to, absolutely, but they didn't investigate, hey, what she, she's feeling, insecure. Every adult in the airport is on edge, and she's starting to feel it too. And yet they didn't take time to walk her through that. Listen for feelings. Let me share with you a couple of times. When should you be listening? Let's let me share with you some times that I think are, are great times to be listening, and you can find some of these in God's Word. God says we're supposed to talk to our children uh, when they get up. Listen, first thing in the morning. That may be a time of silence when you have to listen to that, but listen. Listen when they go to bed. I cannot tell you the number of conversations when I went to bed 
And I woke up and Autumn and I started to pray together the next morning. She said, hey, the girls and I stayed up for a couple hours last night. I just sat on their bed and they talked. They just poured out what was going on. Their guards dropped. Just, just listen at bedtime. When you get up, when you go to bed. Listen when, when they're sick. It might help you see some of their fears. It might help you see some of their anxieties. Uh, listen uh, when they have a victory. And it might not seem like a victory to you. You can't imagine why in the world they're so excited, but something's happened in their life and they are so excited and they're just on edge. Listen to them when they have a victory. Listen to them when they repent. They might not call it repentance. They might just simply say, I'm sorry. Listen to them and talk with them about it. Make time to listen to them. For me... The best time that I ever had listening to my girls was when I structured time for just me with one of them one-on-one -on -one, all alone. Make some time. Listen to them when you're alone with them. Teach them how to open up. This ability to listen gives us a spirit of approachability. And our kids need to know that we're approachable. Looking ahead, looking at, looking behind, looking after gives us a spirit of authority. Stopping, dropping, and rolling with God gives us a spirit of authenticity. One more word. Not in the sermon title, but it's the word receive. Receive. Parents, I need to ask you if you're willing to receive everything that God wants to give you. See, God is striding ahead of you. He sees what's coming down your path. He's walking alongside of you, and He comes in behind you. He surrounds you and he wants to give you everything that you need. Here, here's what I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt right now for everybody that's listening. God has called everyone to make one of two decisions. The first decision very simply is this, that you put your trust in Jesus as your savior so that he can forgive your past. Or that you put your trust in Jesus as your Lord so he can direct your future. Beyond any shadow of a doubt, God's calling you to one of those two things. By the way, when it comes to listening, I hate to tell you, but the scriptures aren't going to give you very many positive examples of human parents who knew how to listen. They're just not there. A lot of parents play favorites. A lot of parents do some things that aren't, you know, don't have anything to do with listening. But I can tell you but the biblical writers say this, I love the Lord because he bends down, looks me in the eye, and listens to me. You have a heavenly dad who wants to listen. So let me say it this way. You'll forgive the corniness. Did you realize that there came a point in human history when your heavenly dad stopped because he knew you had a need? And he dropped his one and only son, Jesus, into the womb of a virgin and out her, her birth canal for you. He lived a life of perfection. He died a death on a cross. And three days later, he rolled away the stone for you so that you could live, so that you could have life. There came a time in your life, that your heavenly father stopped. He dropped to your level. Eugene Peterson, in his paraphrase of John chapter 1, says the word became flesh, flesh and blood, and moved into the neighborhood. He got to our level, and he rolled back the stone so that you can live. There are some of you today that need to say yes to Jesus as your Savior to forgive your past. There are some of you, however, that have said that, and today you simply need to say yes to Jesus as your Lord so that he can direct your future, so that he can teach you how to look ahead, look at, and look after for your children, so that he can teach you how to listen, so that you can create a home. And friends, there's no place like home when those who are in charge understand their number one task is to stop, look, and listen. So that when their children say goodbye to them, they're ready to say hello to the rest of the world. Almighty God, in this moment, you've brought each of us to a place of decision where we will either say 
yes, I put my trust in Jesus to be my Savior, to forgive my sin. God, if there's someone here today that, that needs a Heavenly Father like that, they've never had anyone to listen to them, they've never had anyone to get to their level, and, and, and they've just been evaluating themselves on, on performance. God, may you help them see that they will never be good enough, they will never do enough, they will never earn enough to make you love them. You love them simply because they are your child and you created them. May they understand that your acceptance of them is not based on what they can do, but it's based on what Jesus has already done. God, if there's someone like that, may they just pray a prayer like this. God, I don't understand it, but I, I ask Jesus to be my Savior. I need Him to forgive my sins and forgive my past. And God, I want to be the kind of person that allows Him now to direct my future. Father, for those of us that are parents, for those of us that are struggling in the workplace, for those of us that have decisions ahead of us, may we simply surrender to you as Lord and allow you to direct our future. God, if there's a parent here whose heart is breaking, breaking for a child who's rebelled, breaking for a child who's turned, breaking for a child, heart, breaking for a child who's walked away, God, I, I pray that you would strengthen their heart that you would encourage them. God, for the ones who think that it's just too late, well, my child's gone and now they're out of the house and I have grandchildren, will you help us understand that, that we never lose our voice of influence, that our children always need to know that a hand of our presence is right there and that we can still be a voice of security and hope in their lives. God, regardless of what stage of parenting we're in, would you give us wisdom? And God, I pray right now for that family who's begged of you to give them children. And yet they still struggle with infertility and the pain and the hurt that goes along with that and it's led them to question you. God, I pray in this moment that they would trust you as their Lord, that you are going ahead of them, that you walk right now beside them to strengthen them and that what they don't see now, you can review with them. So God, may they trust you. Father, we love you. We thank you for the ways that you've spoken to us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you made a decision today on one of those cards, would you put it in the, one of the joy baskets as you walk away from one of our local venues? If you're watching online, as soon as this gathering's over, uh, you're going to see a screen. Would you email me? Would you let me know the decision that you've made so that we can talk with you and pray with you this week? Would you stand with me for a word of blessing and benediction? Now, my brothers and sisters, moms and dads of all ages, single parents, step parents, empty nesters, grandparents, those who aren't parents yet, to all the children in the room, should Jesus not come back until we get together in this place again next week? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And may your home be a place where people are built up and encouraged. And where you stop and honor God. Where you look ahead, at and after. And where you listen intently. And where you grow in love for God and each other. God bless you. We'll see you next week.